welcome everybody um, we're gonna look at the industry um, just look at where it's going uh, what we might expect in in 2017 uh, sorry 2016 and beyond um, interesting to see some of your answers there to the um, questions what should the telcos focus on in 2016 so we've got things like coverage internet of things new business models um, connectivity um, gigabit copper we're going to talk about most of that now obviously this session is meant to last around 30 minutes so to do any of that in detail is impossible so we're just looking for a flavor um, some of the main threats to ex existing business things like over the top Wi-Fi um, yeah and very specific one there for the UK market open reach staying within BT um, we'll be talking about most of that um, as well so thanks for uh, for some of those views okay so I've just gone full screen um, hopefully everybody can see it okay so I'm Tony Wakefield I'm the training director of the Informer Telecoms Academy I joined BT in 1981 which is too many years ago but um, uh, sorry let me just a bit of a um, slow start to this but Cabway, you say you, you Enrique you can't hear um, Nigel loud and clear okay guys I think I'm gonna go have to go with it I think we checked all the audio it seems to be working fine so if you can't hear um, probably your end but we will send out a, a recorded um, a link to the recording of it okay so I, I joined BT in 1981 um, I learned about telecoms when it was simple um, I went up the poles down the holes worked in the exchanges um, it, it was simple by then I think telecoms fundamentally is still simple I just think we do it in such a complicated way now the, the actual specifics of it are very complex but the fundamentals of it actually are, uh, are, are still um, not, not, main, not entirely the same but you know they, they've sort of evolved over the years um, but I think the uh, the fundamentals foundations of it is still pretty much um, intact as it was sort of 35 40 years ago um, I spent a bit of time in the Royal Navy um, in aviation but I came back into telecoms back into training in 1996 so I've been training now for the last 20 years and spending um, a lot of my time with companies um, like um, Vodafone and uh, MTN and Zane, a lot in the Middle East, a lot in Africa, um, some in the States, some in the, in the Far East. Um, I deliver on a lot of postgraduate type courses, so the management type courses. I still do quite a lot of um, technology training as well. Um, and I think in the academy, we're very lucky in that we do get to spend time with a lot of um, big operators, T1 operators, talking to management teams, trying to understand their pain points. Um, trying to understand what their focus is um, hopefully adding value to that whole process as well um, uh, and really trying to, to gain consensus on, on things like strategy whether it's business model strategy or whether it's um, the strategy that's sort of underpinning the, uh, the, the technology so um, so in the, in the academy we, we we try and make sure that we cover a really wide range of training um, just so that it gives us that breadth of expertise if you like or at least breadth of, of interpretation of the industry so that when we're talking about technology we can talk about the implications of it when we're talking about uh, business strategy we understand what the limitations are in terms of the technology and and you know that that's the way in which we try and operate and if we need two or three trainers we will send two or three trainers to a training course to give us um, the right sort of breadth and the right sort of um, uh, uh, expertise so we've got the School of Telecoms Management, the School of Advanced Communication Technologies and Distance Learning as well. Um, and just because a lot of what we see in telecoms is applicable to adjacent industries as well, so it's no longer just telecom specific. Um, we've also developed um, the Innovation Academy. You'll see here the Innovation Academy is not only for adjacent industries, but pretty much any industry. Um, that's facing the same sort of problems in and around things like transformation, digital leadership, 
cultural change, um, all those sort of big, big topic areas. So Telecoms Academy and Innovation Academy very much um, hand in hand. Um, the agenda for this afternoon um, is first of all the uh, major telecoms trends and financial outlook, uh, a look at the pain points, um, look at changing business models, a little bit on service developments, a few slides on major technology developments and key areas of focus for 2016 just followed by a, a word about one of the key things that telecoms operators need to get much better at which is um, partnerships. Okay so first of all uh, where's the information from? Well a lot of it is from our own informer um, research teams and that now is in the form of inf uh, OVUM. So OVUM, one of the biggest research houses um, in the world um, and certainly a, a, an awful lot of our researchers specialise in telecoms so I think we've got something like um, 150 plus um, specialists who just watch the industry, offer advice, um, build um, data models um, uh, and provide insights and, uh, and business intelligence. So a lot of it is, a lot of this data is based on the OVM um, information and the intelligence center. But you know, equally, we don't claim to, to have a monopoly on uh, good information. So we do use other sources um, where where uh, where it fits. Um, for example, uh, Ericsson and uh, perhaps Alcatel Lucent, for, just for some examples there. Um, just try and get a, a really good cross um, um, view of the uh, of the industry um, from a, a variety of sources. So first of all, let's have a look at the major telecoms trends and the financial outlook. So um, the OVMAT analysts they start with key trends and they're always updating their views. Um, some of the latest ones that we see from the, some of the latest reports for 2016 competition affecting revenues. Now that's significant because telecoms operators are already under pressure in terms of revenues. It's affecting profits. It's um, it's affecting um, the makeup of the industry in, in most markets. There's a lot of consolidation coming through because if there's no additional revenues to be made, if there's no additional profits to be made, then we need to continue um, with our drive for good performance and, and very often that will come through um, in, in terms of consolidation so bringing together two companies with um, uh, complementary um, uh, you know complementary uh, businesses or complementary uh, business models um, and hopefully allowing them to realize some of the uh, cost savings or some of the performance in improvements by bringing those companies together. So there's um, th there's a lot to be said uh, in and around competition and how that might affect um, revenues. We talk about subscription growth um, hovering around 5% in 2016. So this is across the industry, not just mobile. You know, mobile, we are struggling um, to, to get any sort of growth out of our markets. Um, fixed, again, we're, we're struggling. So what we're doing is we're trying to bring uh, different um, services together in the form of um, in the form of um, convergence, so that we get packages which we can offer to customers, which include fixed mobile, um, broadband, and content. You might find that content in a market is a way to drive some additional um, growth, because people are paying for, for example. Um, uh, to, to watch sporting events. So sporting rights within a, a national uh, geography would be a way in which an operator might look for, for the, some of these additional uh, uh, revenue streams. Wi-Fi calling and voice over LTE. So what we're saying here is um, finally we're starting to talk seriously about voice as a, a data service. So voice over uh, the internet protocol. So using the IP um, technology as a way of carrying carrying uh, uh, voice information um, and that's starting to manifest itself in good quality simple interfaces um, 
in, in terms of you know uh, voice over Wi-Fi or um, for some operators, not all operators yet, but for some operators voice over um, LTE. Got things like tariff innovation, and it's not too long ago that we looked at Verizon and they introduced a sort of big data plan on which you can um, hook a, a, a number of different devices and you pay for the data itself and then you pay extra for each device that you might want to sort of hook onto that. And that was the start of perhaps operators thinking a little bit differently about um, tariffs and how they might charge for things. Um, a lot of operators have been hampered they haven't been able to do a lot in terms of innovation, tariff innovation over the years, because they haven't had good advanced billing systems in place, which which they need to give them the flexibility um, in and around uh, these sort of areas. So tariff innovation um, and actually bringing some of that innovation on the pricing schemes um, into the marketplace is perhaps a big key for 2016 as well. Network transformation to reduce the costs. This is key. We talk about network function virtualization. Um, many years ago, some of us might have had a, I don't know if you remember the PDAs um, that we used to have and a cal separate calculator and a separate web processing machine. And then we might have had a computer device for our games. And then all of a sudden the PC came along, which was a generic computing device on which we can have different things running at different times. Well, that's exactly what we're talking about with NFV, network function virtualization. Operators been able to pay for off-the-shelf computing um, uh, equipment and then program them, program them to be um, perhaps a home location register or perhaps a security database or whatever it is they need them to be. Um, just intuitively, you can see that that's probably going to re realize uh, a lot of additional flexibility for operators, but um, in the longer term, um, cost savings as well in terms of uh, equipment costs. So some of the operators that we're working with are saying, look, you know, the way in which the network transforms from this date, every single major network investment will incorporate the best of things like network function virtualization to try and try and get those uh, costs down and get the flexibility up. Um, new revenue opportunities really key for telcos um, and this is probably the best way to look at this is that just at this point in time the world is going through a second digital revolution the first one was about telecoms operators connectivity the internet the next one is about looking at every single other industry and saying okay how does that industry intend to operate going forward um, how are they going to reach their customers in terms of what the customers actually buy from them, how they advertise, how they use things like big data. And there's a lot of themes going on where the telco can get right at the heart of the value chains and say, look, you know, we can add value here because we're a trusted brand. We're a great local partner for some of these big internet companies. Um, we understand security. We understand the legal aspects of operating in a certain territory. You know, the telcos have got a massive amount to offer as the other industries digitalize. So this is where telcos need to seek out new revenues um, and new revenue opportunities. And it's not easy and nobody really knows how to do it yet, but that will be a big theme in, in 2016. Um, consolidation, we're going to continue to consolidate, get those synergies in there, get the cost base down. Um, and we're certainly seeing it in the UK at the moment with BT and EE. And a few years ago, that started with um, EE forming out of the what was Orange and T-Mobile. But we've seen it in other parts of the world as well. Um, and it's starting to accelerate. Um, that's important. Um, for example, when consolidation happened in Austria uh, a couple of years ago, the number of um, operators went mobile operators went down by one. If you look at the pricing after that, um, that that consolidation, prices were able to rise by, I think about 10% in, in, in some areas, um, which is massive in terms of the bottom line. Um, let's see, let's just move on a little bit. Um, telco response to all of this is transformation. And we've seen this for the last 
year. It's um, the conversations we've been having with operators. It's been around building strength in terms of digital leadership and innovation. Um, they're looking at strategy and business models, co um, corporate and business culture. So actually, you know, getting people to think differently and do different things. It's about customer proposition and focus, and it's about enablers, platforms, and processes. So there's an awful lot going on out there, and that's really just just the big picture. Um, here's some information from the World Telecom's financial benchmarks. Um, probably look at the top left and the bottom right charts. But if we look at the top left, total revenues in terms of the left-hand scale, so that's the, the line there, um, total revenues have in the last within the last year or so they've been fairly flat um, increasing revenues increasing we're finding some new revenue streams just the last couple of quarters we managed to get some growth back in there but when you look at the net income or if you like the profits um, when we look at the growth in profits there's a zero line and this is fixed on mobile these are the top 40 operator groups profits have either declined or been flat so as an industry that's where we are as we go into 2016 that's where we are um, profits have been fairly flat um, for the traditional communication service provider or the traditional telco it gets a little bit worse than that because when we look at revenue growth through to the second quarter of 2015 which is the latest data we have you'll see that for mobile and fixed it's been dropping um, quite significantly in terms of revenues but when you look at the internet content providers so your Google's Amazon those sort of companies you'll see that they're the ones within the communications sectors communication and media sectors that have actually managed to get some revenue growth so I think that's quite interesting in that there is a bit of a shift so if the shift is happening towards the big internet type brands that those with global coverage you know what is the role for the communication service provider and the telco is it that we've got to become local partners to these big internet brands and I think just from a graph like this um, we've got to give consideration to that but that's not saying that that's good or bad it's just that we've got to learn to operate in the right way to maximize those opportunities because at the end of the day you know Google doesn't ha understand how to operate effectively for example in in Qatar but you know who do you do um, so partnerships could be uh, could be in order in terms of world revenue um, overall US um, dollars million dollars um, out to 2019 we think in terms of fixed revenues we're going to see some growth kind of flatten out from 2017 um, and the over analysts will look at mobile and again they think there's a little bit of growth um, certainly not from voice which is a blue line there um, but coming from from data so that's really from 2013 at the moment 2016 finally finally in mobile um, revenue from data will overtake voice either this year or next year finally um, this is quite interesting because how much are individuals um, paying for their services well the average revenue per user um, overall for cellular is still decreasing out to 2019 that's what the uh, analysts see that's what the research um, suggests um, certainly data overtaking voice and by the end of next year it, it will have done that um, but voice RP continuing to fall so you know we, as an industry we've got to find ways of of maximizing that data um, RP and the data revenues okay so let's move on to um, item two So let's look at some established and developing pain points um, I'll be honest I could spend all day on this um, all we've done is just picked out some of the obvious ones um, really just three slides but first of all there is a second digital revolution um, happening we, we've 
as an industry, we have enabled um, a lot of this. We've put fantastic connectivity in place. We've got good price plans, great handsets out to the customers, and it's allowed them to do an awful lot more. Other industries, other companies can now do an awful lot more as well. So what it means is that uh, big picture wise, we can sort of look at um, the rate of technology adoption and we can look at the level of disruption to today's ecosystem within telecoms and we can look at over the top providers coming in and taking some of our voice revenues, etc. Um, Overm have done some analysis on this and they think that out to 2025, the level of disruption to today's telecoms ecosystems will be high. The rate of technology adoption will remain fast. So their core scenario is that there is a digital revolution happening. New business models reaching larger audiences because the over-the-top providers can do it with, with, with the right sort of um, scale. And traditional players are forced to respond quickly or die. So that means getting innovation in there, looking at, at our pricing, looking at partnerships, perhaps changing the way in which we operate to be local partners for for the big industry players. So that's one of the major pain points. That's you know the overall movement in the industry. Um, the second thing is let's just bring it back down to basics. You know if we're a, if we work for a cellular operator, um, markets are saturated, and these are regional figures. But this is from the Ericsson Mobility Report, February um, last year. Um, globally, there are 99 SIM cards for every 100 people. And when I say 100 people, I mean babies, old people, people who've never had a phone before, which means a lot of people have got two handsets or two SIM cards. But 99% represents um, not quite saturation, but in some markets, Central and Eastern Europe, Western Europe, you know, these markets are pretty much saturated which means there's no new customers unless we take them from from our competition. So that's another big pain point for um, cellular. And then when you look at um, saturated markets, when there's no new customers, and you look at the average revenue per user, and it looks like it's falling, as our analysts think. You know, this big one here is North America, but um, pretty much in all regions of the world, ARPU is falling. Um, then there's an issue. You know, we've got to do things differently. We've got to get the costs down. We've got to get the synergies in place in terms of consolidation. We've got to use those new technologies to realize cost savings for the future, like network function virtualization. And we've got to make the most of new revenue opportunities, like supporting the other industries, supporting the Internet of Things. Um, we need to change your business models effectively. So, you know, we can go so far in terms of convergence. We can um, we can consolidate if we are a fixed operator, we can buy a mobile operator or vice versa, or we can include media in that. So we build a, a really good set of converged service offerings. Um, and it's made easier perhaps by the use of cloud service concepts. So where we've got the connectivity in place, a lot of the things that we provide in the future can be provided in a, in a relatively um, cost-effective way and efficient manner by using cloud service concepts. So realizing the potential of convergence means operators move in much more towards this cloud um, service concept whilst transforming the business, including our business models to better reflect the uh, environment that, that we're in and to really drive the efficiencies, network transformation, optimizing, integrating, getting in capability frameworks instead of individual services. So, you know, we invest in a really good advanced billing system, which can have real time billing as a, an essential part of it, rather than investing in something which is going to give us only one service, uh, some sort of service delivery platform. So capabilities, capability frameworks, absolutely key. Um, but then in terms of the business models, you know, we need to go further than that. So the Overham research, research team have 
come up with concepts and they've sort of analysed it and said, okay, we think that um, going into the future, we are looking at perhaps smart players um, being the key players in the industry. So they're the ones who provide uh, one or more services, management of the devices and, and, and experience, um, applications, relationship management, and technology and connectivity. So SMA, RT, smart player. And that's a theme which I think, well, not only is it easy to remember, um, but it's a theme that perhaps, you know, if you work for a uh, telco and, and you're looking at future strategy, it's no longer about just looking at the technology bit, the connectivity. You know, it's about taking on board ideas within more advanced services, within the management um, of the uh, of the customer, not not just consumers, but business customers as well, enterprise um, uh, enterprises as well, and you know the relationships and and the data that goes with those relationships. So all of that is is uh, valid, I think. Um, but what it means is that this is such a wide remit of areas that could possibly uh, form part of our, our the structure of our business models and our, and our business going forward that we end up competing with a real range of, of providers. So as a communication service provider, as a telco, we sit there. But you've got content providers, you've got network enablers, you've got IT vendors, a whole range of different types of players. But you can look at, at the strength. So communication service provider, this, the width of this line here indicates that we will be really good at making our money from broadband connectivity. But there's probably going to be good opportunities in IT and enterprise. Why? Well, because we're a big company with a big brand. We're trusted. We have these big data centers. Um, we've got people, lots of people that can support um, other industries and other companies you know there are some real opportunities there certainly traditional communication we've got um, opportunities there TV well yeah not not to develop the TV content itself but certainly to help bring it to market for sure so when you sort of look at a diagram like this you look at a table like this and look at all the different um, uh, players that are involved in in the industry and look at our bit of it it puts it in context so it's really up to you know the management in the communication service to provide providers say look you know we've got these great opportunities but also how do we enable these guys to do what they're good at how do we enable these guys to do what they're good at you know how can we get the additional revenue streams from from these emerging value chains and that's what a lot of um, the focus will be on in 2016 i feel just just from what we've experienced talking to some of our, our big customers Okay, so what about service developments? Um, well, wide and varied. Um, I quite like this um, diagram from, again, the Ericsson Mobility Report, um, because this is pretty tangible. They're saying, look, in terms of uh, connected devices, and obviously from that you can sort of infer that connected devices, the different types, will require different services. So this is really a manifestation of the uh, movement um, in terms of uh, services that we as an industry will be providing you see there's some major growth in machine to machine so from 2014 here to 2021 here Ericsson are predicting huge number of additional uh, machine to machine non-cellular connected devices and some growth in machine to machine and consumer electronics cellular and consumer electronics non-cellular so this is quite interesting really because this gives you the wider context it's saying look you know as an industry do we need to just say okay our service is connectivity uh, cellular connectivity or can we widen it can we say okay as an industry transportation you know, we will connect you but it's not going to be on our traditional technology it's not going to be on cellular but we can do an awful lot of other things you know we can use uh, low power Bluetooth, we can use um, 5G, which at the end of the day has been developed more for the Internet of Things than for um, existing type services. And I think we've got to think like that. We've got to say, okay, um, you know, we are 
bigger than just a, a cellular network. We provide connectivity, we provide management of devices, we provide management of, of enterprise services. And I'll show you what I mean in a, in a few minutes when we look at the focus for 2016. Um, we've got to identify those new opportunities. So just continuing um, to look at, at service developments, um, digital services. Um, we've they've been around for a couple of years, obviously longer than that, but in terms of you know, reality on the ground um, as an industry, most they, they've come to most people's attentions over the last year or two. We've been doing a lot of work in um, a place in Africa with some forward-looking operators who are looking at digital services as a way of generating new revenues. I think that's consistent throughout the industry. But I think what I'm saying is that most telcos are now saying, okay, you know, we need to get on board with this. Um, and it's a whole range of new services. The analysts are saying to the uh, operators, you know, there's an awful lot of services here. It might be good if you want to get vertical quickly, i.e. get ready to support these other industries, but get good at one or two, one or two of these things. You know, don't try and be everything to everybody, um, but get really good at supporting some of these new digital service categories one or two of them and maybe get good at supporting one or two of the major industries overall up until this point we've seen a fairly scattered have decided that they're going to try and be pretty much everything to to everybody and it's really not worked up until this point i think the nearest we've got to it is docomo in japan who have been providing digital services digital lifestyle type services for the last 15 20 years you know when they first came up with iMode but other companies like Telefonica like Vodafone um, like MTN you know we've had varying success we've been great at some things but not so good at others and it's led to um, services being started and closed down within six months in some cases sometimes we've uh, developed whole digital services um, uh, divisions sometimes have been quite successful sometimes have been about trying to share best practice with other parts of of that particular um, company or group of companies um, sometimes have been given full profit and loss um, uh, responsibility with key you know profit um, uh, kpis and it's sometimes it's just not worked so i think going forward it seems like as, as these as these markets saturate, you know, we've got to get on board with digital services. It, they've got to become an integral part of what we do. They've got to be an integral part of us as an industry and group of companies identifying new opportunities and supporting this stuff. And we need the right sort of technologies and the right sort of platforms in place. And it's, it, I don't think it's um, no longer is it optional, but, you know, we don't have to do everything. Um, likewise, we've been very one dimensional in terms of our communication. And as we move to the next stage, as we adopt these digital services, as we adopt information communication uh, technology techniques, so the ICT techniques, which includes things like you know, handling of data, keeping data safe, uh, access to data, um, all that sort of stuff. So in proper information um, handling uh, in and around communication. Um, a big part of this is things like unified communications. And as we move to the next stage, the ITT stage, um, or if you like, as we move to things like voice over LTE, it gives us an opportunity to redefine um, communications. So in terms of services, you know, we know that some of the big operators have spent quite a long time putting in new platforms to provide a much better communication service to the enterprise customers and i think in 2016 we're going to start seeing this starting to roll out more and more to the consumers not least because actually as we move to voice in the lte um, te technology sphere then voice over lte um, is simply the voice over ip it is this unified communication stuff so again in 2016 we're going to see um, quite a bit more of, uh, of the operators redefining their communication um, services which I think is fair okay so in terms of major technology developments where do we need to go next um, well uh, 
there's some great work being done by the Next Generation Mobile Network Alliance um, ahead of 5G, and they're looking at things like network capabilities, enablers for operational sustainability, and enablers for business agility, and all of this stuff, the current trends in technology, all of this is happening. So whether it's more base stations in the cellular network with carrier aggregation, a lot of this applies to fixed as well as mobile, by the way. Um, whether it's antenna techniques, whether it's network function virtualization, API exposure, a lot of... <coughs> Excuse me, I was trying to um, shield you guys from my cold, but didn't quite, uh, <laughs> didn't quite do it that time. Uh, thank you, thank you, Gennady. Um, so, you know, there's a lot going on here in terms of um, current um, trends in terms of um, in terms of the technology and I think a lot of this will start to solidify and we'll start to bring this um, together in 2016. If we look a little bit further out then you can look at things like um, you know the wider um, technology scope. So the analysts have looked at things like the Internet of Things, cloud computing, analytics, connectivity and they've said okay um, you know we can analyze this in terms of how much of an impact and the certainty that these technologies are going to have and we're fairly sure that the internet of things is going to have a major major impact as is cloud computing you know these two are an absolute given according to the analysts things like artificial intelligence is in there but what about analytics um, this one is security you know that, that's going to become a massive uh, hot topic in the next uh, year or so and things like intelligent machines so I think this is quite an interesting way of analyzing um, technologies going forward it takes us out of you know us as engineers some of us are engineers um, we talk about connectivity we talk about 5g we talk about spectrum but you know this just gives us the wider view because inevitably you know we're going to be working on this stuff it, it's something which is going to start to crystallize um, maybe not 2016 but you know, uh, certainly not too far beyond that. Artificial intelligence, um, virtual reality, I think maybe a little bit further out, but I actually know some of the, um, you know, some of the industry press are talking an awful lot about those sort of topics. Um, but just to bring us right back, you know, we can look at the figures, if you like, for things like fixed broadband, look at where we are in terms of cable modems, fibre to the home or fibre to the building, and the DSL copper stuff, and you can look at the number of um, the number of uh, connections. And although people, you know, if there's copper in the ground, you don't need fibre. Um, as long as your copper isn't too long at the moment, you don't need fibre. But inevitably, you know, in new markets or places where we're very forward-looking, places like perhaps Qatar or Dubai or um, well, a lot of places really. Um, We've decided to go the whole hog and look look for fiber and, uh, and uh, place that in the ground because that will give us the not, not only a advantage in terms of our customers within telecoms, but we're looking at at this being sometimes driven by governments uh, because they want a competitive advantage in terms of the economy. So, in terms of fixed, we're looking at perhaps gigabit type copper to try and really drive some of the really high speed of the existing infrastructure that's in the ground without having to replace it. So Western Europe, fantastic. That gives us options and means we don't have to spend billions and billions replacing the sort of last couple of hundred yards of, of copper um, while still getting perhaps one, 1 1.5 gigabits per second using GFAST type technologies. Um, but in other places, you know, where nothing's in the ground, we've got new high rises being built, um, then we're going to go fibre. And in some places, the government are just driving the whole uh, move towards fibre. So we've got a real mix in terms of fixed. In terms of mobile, um, LT is more efficient than, than 3G. So the green stuff here, you know, really from 2015, from this point, I think we're going to see a, out to 2020, 2021, we're going to see LT really start to proliferate. Um, worldwide not just in specific markets but there is a need for 5g um, 
but it's not capacity because at the end of the day um, if we're using a very very um, efficient uh, radio system then in terms of capacity you know how do you get any better than that I think what 5g brings is is a lot of flexibility so if there is something more efficient than the OFDMA that we're using for LTE great we'll bring it into 5g so capacity is part of it for sure but it's probably more thing things like millisecond latency so things like the driverless car it's going to need a probably need some sort of connectivity I think the Google car at the moment certainly needs that um, but you know we're talking about instant decisions instant reaction instant reporting millisecond latency is perhaps one of the major requirements for 5g and then we can think okay well actually you know LTE does a great job in terms of consumer but it, we could do better if it's high density broadband high use and mobility we could do better than perhaps than LTE ultra reliable communication again we could do better than LTE so LTE is fantastic what I'm saying is that we've been able to define these usage cases and these are the sort of things that will be the focus really for 5G so 5G first deployments 2020 2021 um, at the earliest I think one or two companies have said they're going to go for 2018 um, probably pre standardization um, implementations almost certainly given the timelines as they look at the moment but a lot of this seems to be a little bit fluid um, but the, the main thing is that there's a lot of work being done right now on sort of satisfying these use cases use cases and if you look at these use cases you know these are exactly the sort of use cases that you need to make sure are well supported when we move to the next big dig digital revolution internet of things machine to machine etc so it, it's all consistent all consistent um, with the direction that we're going in um, and a big part of this is network function virtualization so we're supporting a lot more devices a lot of different types of devices um, so we need a lot of flexibility and we need a platform which will place the load in the right place within the geography within the operator to give us the um, to give us the right sort of uh, uh, efficiencies so things like NFE will be a big part of, of 5G okay so having said all of that again another topic that I could spend probably all afternoon on um, areas of focus for 2016 things like the internet of things and that came up with a couple of you on the um, on the poll before we started so it's the connected world um, mobile fixed public private enterprise domestic the next big stage of the digital future so the internet of things and telecoms defining their role in it you know you can go to hardware stores now big stores in the US looking at on Amazon there's a lot of things on sale which need to be connected and they're even selling the apps um, that you need to control them so you know in terms of the consumer world this is already forging ahead I think where it gets interesting for telcos is when the internet of things um, starts really expanding out of some of the niches that we've been um, supporting over the years because we've done a lot of work in these areas of course we have but you know if we see some sort of a an explosion in growth and lots of industries lots of companies wanting to get involved then you know we need the platforms uh, we need the infrastructure we need the mindsets to deal with it and you know there's we've done some research on um, the different sort of industry verticals and what uh, and what some of this is going to be worth and it's in terms of connectivity in terms of uh, revenues it, it's massive so we've got to be prepared for it so again another area of focus and you can sort of fast forward to things like so for example this is Santander in Spain which is European Union um, sort of test bed for the smart city you can look at what's happening in places like Santander you can look at what's happening in um, places like um, uh, Qatar you know we've got a new brand new smart city just going up outside of Doha um, and, and quite a few more municipalities sort of looking at this and we can start identifying um, opportunities 
for partnerships and where the telco and the telecoms industry can fit in in terms of trying to support some of these initiatives because the big government or big sort of municipality type initiatives and they need support to bring it to market and they need assurances in terms of data privacy security um you know the, the, even the fact that we work for big companies who are unlikely to go bust um touch wood <laughs> um you know even that consideration probably puts the telco in, in poor position for supporting a lot of these big new initiatives uh, and these across industry so i think a lot of the opportunities that, that we're sort of seeing um, need to come about but by a greater understanding of the way in which society, work, other businesses, how they're transforming. Um, as, a, as, as a group of companies within a specific industry like telecoms, we've been majorly successful, which means that we've got embedded routines, embedded ways of thinking. One of the massive things for us is to change um, change what we do and how we do it in terms of innovation and uh, and uh, digital leadership etc um, and and part of that is embracing partnerships you're really recognizing what we're good at and we're good at a lot of things on the left hand side here not quite so good at some stuff on the right hand side perhaps brand there's one or two um, exceptions I think Vodacom in South Africa is still the, uh, the, the top indigenous South African brand but in general, we've not been great at, at this sort of stuff or even retail. So it's about recognizing what we're good at, recognizing what we're weak at, putting it in the context of where we need to go next as an industry um, and building the right competences and not being afraid of actually, you know, getting ourselves into a an ecosystem or into a value chain where we can add massive value, not just in terms of connectivity, but in terms of brand, our people, the way we think, agility, so ability to move fast. Uh, and I think that's the way in which we're going to survive and thrive going forward. And, and a lot of that is going to start coming through in 2016. So we looked at the uh, major trends, we looked at the pain points, we looked at business models, we looked at service developments, we looked at areas for focus, and we've looked at partnerships. Um, just over 45 minutes, um, so apologies for that, but um, that just leaves perhaps the option for a few questions. So I don't, has anybody got any questions that is burning right now? You can always send me an email at tony.wakefield, sorry, tony.wakefield at informer.com. So I'm just, um, if you want to use the uh, question and uh, comment pod, that would be great. Uh, perhaps if you would, if you'd be good just to um, perhaps rate the presentation, that'd be great while we're just taking some questions. We will send this out to you. We will send um, a copy of the, uh, of the recorded presentation. I'm sorry we don't have, uh, you know, sort of, 30 to 45 minutes we normally schedule these for and it's uh, um, inevitably we do go over but I um, hope you appreciate that you know, we don't have time really to go into a lot of detail on these but um, do feel free to email through that would be great yeah small cells um, in 2016 at the end of the day a lot of data to a lot of users means a lot of base stations you can't get around that if you put more, if you put more, um, uh, if you put more um, spectrum in each of the base stations, great. You're gonna, if you double the spectrum, you get double the capacity, roughly. Um, but at the end of the day, if you've only got a set amount of spectrum, then you're gonna need to um, increase the number of base stations, which is why things like um, Wi-Fi offload and femtor cells are so um, important. Uh, you know, it's a sort of really good integrated strategy for um, for delivering capacity. Um, but that also plays into the hands of the converged providers because if you've got fixed infrastructure, you've already got those copper wires 
or those fiber optic cables straight into somebody's house and even for a cellular you know getting a wi-fi router on the end of it or a femto cell or a, a mixed version of both of those um, is relatively straightforward um, right so the, the core network developments cope with 5g i think the major movements here are um, almost certainly going to be things like NFV, network function virtualization, because at the end of the day, when you look at the LTE core network, I don't think it could get any simpler than that. Um, so we've simplified it pretty much as, as much as we can, and then there will be specifications in and around the core network. We don't know what they're going to be yet. We've not seen the specifications um, uh, at any sort of uh, level of uh, completion yet, but I think it's going to embrace uh, Primarily, um, NFV, I, I would think. Yeah, customer self-care management systems in 2016. Um, Gennady, we, uh, we, we talk a lot about that because at the end of the day, that's a way of, one, putting more control in the hands of the customer and two, um, making it a lot easier for the operator to uh, self-manage. Uh, and this is part of this whole move towards better billing systems as well. So the whole business support system back end allowing for self-provisioning, things like paying for things on the fly as you get to a certain point in a in a connection. You maybe you want to upgrade to HD from SD. You know, have you got the ability to do that? Um, it, it's all linked and a lot of operators are looking very seriously at it. Um, it always amazes me that operators are not further down the road with this that, than they are. Um, they do need they do need to accelerate um, in that area, I think. So I think, I think in terms of um, self-care, we're gonna, we are gonna see uh, um, quite a focus on that this year. I would have thought. Uh, Living, sir, I'm not sure. Um, perhaps if you email that question in, um, challenges in terms of uh, voice over Wi-Fi or Volte, um, I'll pass it on to Dave who. Um, handles a lot of our radio planning type courses so Shahid if you want to email that in that would be great so it's tony.wakefield at informa.com oh Nigel um, yeah if you email in as well Nigel um, so in terms of smart cities um, there's not a huge amount out there we're just looking at doing some uh, uh, briefings and some training courses on that and developing it but um, if you if you send in an email uh, Nigel, I'll uh, try and point you in the right direction to get some more information on that. Okay, thanks guys. I'm just watching to see if there's any more uh, questions come through, but I think 